Well, welcome, Grady. Thank you so much for agreeing to uh, appear on our uh, podcast. So you're, we're going to be showing Police Story 1 and 2 um, on the 16th of March, I believe. That's correct. Um, you contributed to the Criterion uh, Blu-ray package. What did you do? <laughs> Not a whole lot. Uh, basically, they just had me in to talk about sort of uh, Jackie Chan's evolving image at the time and then to shoot my mouth off about... Um, it's kind of the way technology affects the development of Hong Kong mm. action movies uh, and the choreography, but really it just wound up talking about Jackie. It, it's, it's very unfocused. I think it's the one feature on the disc that people will skip. Most likely, uh, um, no. especially because this disc keeps getting more loaded by uh, by the week. I just saw they added the Japanese cut of Police Story Two, and they found a um, the the television show where Jackie and all the little fortune surprise Yoon Jim Yoon, their old master on TV, and like everyone cries, or maybe they surprise Jackie. I'm not sure. Someone surprises <laughs> someone, and everyone cries. It's a happy surprise. Um, it's not like Jackie's surprised by an illegitimate baby or something, but um, but yeah. So they keep adding stuff. So I'll I will definitely be the least interesting thing on there. Well, then we're done. <laughs> <laughs> well, they promised that you were going to uh, uh, bring us every, tell us everything we needed to know about Chan's screen persona and action filmmaking techniques. So why don't you redeem yourself now and you can do it for us. <laughs> You know, the funny thing about this, though, was, you know, it was weird to rewatch the two movies back to back because Police Story 1 is out of nowhere, right? He hadn't done a contemporary movie before, and it was a really new thing. And Jackie was, like, super pissed off at the time because he'd just done um, The Protector with, um, what's his name? Uh, was it Glickenhaus who shot The Protector? Um, and he really hated doing that in the States. It was the Hollywood cop movie, mm. and he was like an angry, dirty Harry cop. And then he is doing um, Heart of the Dragon with Sammo, where he plays like a, a cop, like a hard-ass cop. And it's a great movie, but he's like this really hardcore dude. But it at least has made Hong Kong style. And so Police Story was kind of like his attempt to be like, here's how you really do this. And so he had a lot right. to prove. Um, he spent a lot of his own money on it. Like mm. all the cars in it are his cars that he bought out of pocket. Um, the apartment mm. that Bridget <laughs> Lynn is in is one apartment that he owned. Like the, the equipment, he was buying all his own equipment for the first time. And so it's kind of like, it wasn't like he made hit movies, but he wasn't this global superstar the way he was a few years later. Mm. And he really had something to prove with the movie. And then you watch Please Story 2 and Please Story 2, I love it, but it's a much longer movie. It's a much looser movie. He made it because there was an audience demand to make a sequel mm -hmm. for the Japanese market. And he'd had a couple of movies that hadn't performed as great as they wanted them to. And so it's less urgent feeling like please story two has amazing set pieces in it. Um, and you can see him really experimenting with like car stunts more and with fire and explosions. But it just feels, when you watch them back to back, it feels less urgent for some reason. Gotcha. I actually think the Japanese cut of Police Story 2, even though it's longer, is kind of like, I think it's longer, but it's kind of a lot more fun. There's a little bit of extra character building stuff in it. Mm. And I know Criterion was trying to get, I think, the Japanese cut for Police Story 1, which I, which is really, really ridiculously different. Um, but I don't think they could secure the rights for it. Mm. Um so I, I don't know if that answer. See, that, well, that's, in, that's interesting that you <laughs> yeah. say that because that was my impression when I first saw the two movies. Um, but I would drag people to see them. They played at a double feature at Cinema yeah. Village uh, several times. And I would drag people over to see them. And every single time, people would say, wow, that police story is good. That police story, too, kicks ass. I mean, yeah. everybody mm. liked that. It was, it was as if that was... Um, his hard boiled or something, which I same thing is like when I first saw hard boiled, I said, Well, that's not the John Woo I know and love, but it's right. become the film that everybody yeah. uh, you know adores. Well, the second this is the second alien all over again, right? right? Yeah, and people if, of younger generations than mine, they all prefer the second alien film. Yeah. Did, yeah. You, did you ever meet uh, Jackie Chan? Did you ever have, ever have an opportunity to talk with him? 
No, I mean, only in like a public setting. Like when mm. we had him at the New York Asian Film Festival years ago, like I did the onstage Q&A, which was great. I mean, but he's so polished. You know what I mean? He has right. the stories he tells and right. he's got one for every occasion. And if you watch enough interviews with him, you'll see them kind of repeat. I mean, he's great with the audience, but, you know, it, it's the, the place I actually think he comes across the best is in the books he does and in the weird blog he wrote for a while. Um <laughs> Because the two books he's done, his like autobiographies, uh, like the old one, I Am Jackie Chan That's with Jeff Yang, I mean. and then this mm-hmm. new one with his assistant, it's all about being drunk and spending too much money. He's really self-critical in them and really right. like talks a lot about the flaws in his movies and stuff. And in the blog he used to keep, he kept it for like three years. Uh, I think it was around the time of Rush Hour 2. And I think his assistant was writing it, but he was really involved. And it was just him on publicity junkets and he could never leave the hotel suite and so like he'd eat dinner alone and like just watch the home shopping network and order like 26 treadmills it was really <laughs> weird but it was just like the portrait of this lonely hmm. guy who had everything but he couldn't hang out with anyone um huh. so because i've always wanted to act, like you know you always wonder if filmmakers are happy with their movies you know what right. i mean and like because I assume when he watches his stuff, he only sees things he could have done better and places he fell short, like anyone does when they see their stuff. Um, but, you know, I wonder if the reason people like Please Story 2 is in my memory, the big action set pieces are so amazing. There's the playground thing. There's the explosion in the mall. There's um, the bus jumps. You know, there's that warehouse explosion and fight. But when you watch it all together as a movie, I don't know, it just it lacks a little of the verb that the first one does. You know, um, we're skipping over yeah. your part of this, Grady. How does one become an expert in a film genre? Uh, I'm not an expert by any <laughs> means. Like, there are so many people who know a lot more than I do. But I know a lot for a guy who speaks fluent English. Uh-huh. Um, and, and I'm good at public presentation. And so there's people who speak English who know a lot about Hong Kong movies, a lot more than me, but they're not great at public speaking or writing. And there's people who are you know great at speaking and writing but they're english and they know more about hong kong movies than me but their english isn't as good as mine so i sort of occupy this venn diagram like where i'm <laughs> just good enough on all three that i muddle through gotcha that makes you, sense. now you mentioned having jackie at new york asian film festival um what is that well, Paul, the New York Asian <laughs> Film Festival, it's, uh, it was founded in 2000 by Garan Topalovic, Brian Noss, Nat King, or Nat Olson, and some ass named Paul Kazee, uh, <laughs> and me. Uh, but yeah, we, the, the, we had all been dudes who used to go down to Chinatown to watch um, Hong Kong movies at the Music Palace. And I didn't go to the Rosemary so much because those movies were dirty movies. Uh, <laughs> but I know y'all did. Um, And I'm a nice boy from South Carolina who doesn't do things like that. And um, the Music Palace was closing and had a for sale sign up. And we were like, well, who's going to show the fun movies? Like the art house movies are fine. Wong Kar Wai, Zhang Yimo, all that stuff. But the fun stuff like Stephen Chow and Jackie Chan and all that, no one. I mean, those guys weren't part of the canon yet. And um, or at least the white person canon. And none of us knew what we were doing. I think you and I were both office managers for nonprofits. Uh, I was more of a glorified receptionist. You were an actual office manager. Brian worked at Chase Manhattan Bank. Garan was an electrical engineer. And Nat put his money in and then moved to Hong Kong and was like a DJ for 15 years or something. Mm. Um, But uh, we just all threw in a thousand bucks each and started showing these movies. And we were lucky enough to stumble into the anthology film archives Mm. who helped us out. I mean, really showed us how to do it. And, And we just sort of learned by doing. And it just got to be a bigger and bigger headache every year. <laughs> and not to figure out how to stop it. A headache, yes, but you must have some amazing memories. Yes? Uh, that makes it sound like we're at a funeral. Oh, my God, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun. To do. I mean, the thing for me that I loved about it is for 15 years, 14 years, I mean, I don't know how Paul feels, but I got to stand in the back of a movie theater in New York showing... Hong Kong, and like showing Asian movies from all the places, and movies that meant a lot to me. And so 
it was really lucky to see how audiences reacted, sort of like what they liked, what they didn't like, what, what worked for a Western audience and what didn't. And also, it's really, really fun to show a movie you love to a room full of people in the right context and have them, like, really get a kick out of it. Like, it's really, I don't know, it's, it's a really nice feeling. I don't know, Paul, what did you get out of it? Anything? Oh, yeah, I, well, the same thing, exactly. It was nice to be able to, to, to know that films that we loved, that, that we introduced them to other people and they would come to, to love them. Some of those films would... Uh, you know sprout legs and and go to other festivals and stuff so it was it was very uh rewarding um personally it made me feel like i had decent taste in cinema <laughs> was uh, was was the was a uh was the film fest uh, responsible for any kind of um distribution uh for you know for for dvd pickups and, and anything like that for because you're kind of bringing right you're bringing these movies to uh to, to to the united states that didn't have any kind of distribution in the united states right it, yeah, I mean, you know, like the big one I would say is um, the movie that's on Criterion House, the Obayashi mm, movie. Right. I mean, we were working, Mark Walkow was a member at that point, um, and uh, he knew that this movie was one that, like Criterion licenses a lot of stuff they don't release. It either comes to them in a package with another title, they get seven other movies, or they just pick stuff up in a library, and, and you know, they can only release a certain number of discs. And they had this 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 restored scan of House sitting there in mm. a print that they weren't doing anything with. And Mark really believed in that movie. And so we screened it, and it really became this cult hit. I mean, I think that movie screened Midnights in New York for like four years after that. And wow. they put it out on this loaded disc and all this stuff. And so that was one. But the, to me, the, I mean, there was a few here and there. But to me, Save the Green Planet was another. Mm. I think that we really pushed. Um, we were the first people to ever show Johnny Toe movies outside of, um, or in the North America outside of Chinatowns, mm. um, as this is a filmmaker you should watch. And also we were the first people outside of Asia to show sort of the new Korean cinema back in like 2002, mm. I think, or one, maybe 2001. 2001, I think, yeah. Was it one? Yeah, I believe yeah, so. Korean cinema attacks, which was like, you know, JSA and The Quiet, or not The Quiet Family, but The Foul King and, you know, E.J. Young's early movie and Affair and all this stuff and these Kim Ki Duck's early stuff. All these movies have gone on to be like huge. These directors have gone on to be huge. Barking Dogs mm -hmm. Never Bite. Um, and kind of we were the first person to show it here. But to me, the more interesting stuff is the stuff that missed. Like, <laughs> um, we showed this movie, Kekasili, about uh, poachers in... Do you remember that, Paul? It was uh, the Mountain Patrol one, the yep. poachers. Yeah, yep. And I, the you, audience you, went you, bananas you, like, you liked it more than I did. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoyed it. I wasn't as passionate about it as you were. Yeah, well, it's funny. Like, uh, Don Krim, who was running Kino at the time, really wanted to pick it up. And I think it would have played well. Um, and... He came and saw it both times and got a screen and really agonized over it because they'd had a bad run of luck with Asian movies. Mm. And finally, he decided against it. Um, another one was, uh, um, Paul, was it, it wasn't The Man Who Stole the Sun, the Japanese one. I remember the title. I don't remember that movie the at 70s all. The 70s Japanese one about the high school teacher who builds the atomic bomb. <laughs> you sure I was there? <laughs> I, we, should, yeah, we showed it. This was like 2014, and we got this. I think I'm not sure if it was Mark or who, but maybe it was Sam. But like, really tracked this thing down and got Toei to give us this beautiful print for one screening, and everyone went nuts over it. I mean, it's this weird, insane '70s Japanese movie about a nuclear terrorist, but it's really surreal. And like a lot of distributors wanted it after that because they thought this was another house. And to mm. I think it was either Toei or Toho just wouldn't play ball or work with them. Wow. And then the one I will always regret is um, Jackie Chan's Little Big Soldier, which I was a huge fan of. Mm. And we showed it and I tried to get all these distributors to come because at the time Jackie was about to release his 100th movie, however you're counting his filmography, and they were doing this huge push beside, behind Chinese Zodiac. I think it was like 2012. Mm. And um, this was such a better movie. And I thought it would play art houses. I thought it was like a Sony Pictures Classics movie. And like this would be counter-programming. And like, Jesus Christ, you've got Jackie Chan 
and you've got this movie you could pick up for a song that's a really satisfying movie, but a smart movie and a sad movie. And yeah, a easily the, movie. I, I went and to see I that. I couldn't that. even was, get a distributor there. Yeah, easy, easily movie. the best thing he had done yeah. in years at that point. Yeah, yeah. And we literally, huh. because Jackie Chan, people at that point were associating with the tuxedo and the, like, oh, the spy next door, Medallion. and like literally no distributor would come. I'm not usually associated with bringing the conversation down a notch in culture, <laughs> but um, I guess I'm, I, I had so much fun when Noboru uh, Iguchi was having, director Noboru Iguchi was having darts thrown in his ass. I mean, to me, <laughs> that was downtown New York Asian Film Festival. Yeah, well, you know, we, you know, you can only do that with filmmakers who are really <laughs> in on it. Um, I mean, when I can't remember the name of the director who did the movie Cow, and we gave him his award dressed as a cow. Uh, <laughs> or uh, uh, the guy who did that movie Moroni, or the Japanese puppet movie, and like he had this puppet Godzilla dressed in a Yankees uniform, <laughs> and he waited by the theater door and insisted that every audience member shake Godzilla's hand on the way in. <laughs> uh, that stuff was great. That is wonderful. Yeah, he was a little odd. <laughs> so it was the movie so I mean we can talk now about new subway cinema right and is, yep. is that the new vibe I mean, are we trying to bring people back to the original uh, guy in Godzilla suit starts in the ass vibe yeah well, you know, the thing is the New York Asian Film Festival which is sort of the thing we did for years which is now at Lincoln Center it just got so huge and like all mm. these big guests were coming over and all these big sponsors and, you know, look, sponsors want their photo op and they want right. their value for their money and they want a fancy event. And it was just getting cumbersome. It was like the downtown fun, like wacky stuff was, right. you know, it just wasn't matching. And so the we sort of split. And so it's and it's also logistically, it's just they, the NYFF part. They need their own credit cards and bank accounts and all that. Like, I'm, I'm really tired of every time they start buying plane tickets for the festival for the guests it's like the credit card gets shut down and i have to go into the bank and explain that we're buying a lot of tickets we do this once a year um <laughs> so they're going off and doing the new right. occasion film festival up at lincoln center and the rest of us paul and myself and goran we're and, and a lot of the volunteers who are going back and forth between the two we're just doing the dumb fun stuff like we just did the hong kongathon which was like a 12-hour marathon it was a blast um sold the out i've had in a movie theater in a long time yeah completely sold out yeah completely sold out and what paul was saying earlier about um it's fun to show stuff to people you know we've done we've done a hong kongathon before then it was sort of an unofficial subway event this is an official one but a movie I, we showed at the first one, Cheap Killers, which is insane, became like, I was worried about <laughs> showing it. It became like the one everyone talked about. And at this one, I heard so many people going on and on about Hot War, which <laughs> is a really fantastically terrible 90s movie with Ekan Chang and Jordan Chan. And just the fact that we were sitting in a theater watching Jordan Chan and Ekan Chang talk about virtual reality and computers like was so much stupid fun. <laughs> Yeah, I, I enjoyed it far more than I did looking at the screener uh, when we were trying to choose films for the for the event. I just thought, yeah. oh my god, it, this, this movie is awful. But on the big screen with the right crowd, it I thought yeah. it played well. Here's, here's well, a, yeah. like the Michelle Yeoh Project S. Like when you mm. watch that on your own, you're like, okay, it's a fine movie with an audience. It kills. Uh, yeah, speaking of uh, Michelle Yeoh, I mean, Super Cop Three. Or, I'm sorry, uh, Police Story 3 was called Super Cop, right? And it had Michelle. Yeah. yeah is that right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so Criterion didn't want to keep going and because uh, that's a beautiful film, too. I mean, that's an it's amazing... Miramax. Ah, right yeah. stuff. Okay. So no, okay. no one's getting a hold of anything. <laughs> I can actually dimension, but I think their library is on ice right now. Okay. All right. And what's next? Now, we know you are... I mean, you wrote a novel... And what's happening in Grady's A novel? Life? He's written 14 a in the last three weeks. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, uh, I, um, yeah, I'm doing rewrites on the next book. It was supposed to come out in the fall, but my, oh. um, but people who are not me miss their production schedule deadline. Mm. So it's coming out in March. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I've got a movie that's in post-production called Satanic Panic. 
that the Fangoria guys are putting out that's basically a, a, uh, some really rich one percenters are having a all night ceremony to raise Baphomet and you get hungry so they order pizzas and um, they've lost their virgin for the virgin sacrifice and so the pizza girl who delivers is a virgin so it's sort of pizza girl versus satanists um, and I'm working on a movie right now with um, I, with a director who you would know if I said his name he's he's not He's not like it's not like um like like Christopher Nolan, but he's someone you'd know. He's been on the festival circuit. Does and, it rhyme um, with Schmielberg? <laughs> it's about drug dealers fighting over um prestige animals. Like every drug dealer wants like a lion on wow. a leash, and so this is about like the vets and the 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 keepers who service prestige animals. Um and uh, um yeah, and then I'm uh doing right now I. I did that book, Paperbacks from Hell, which is sort of a history of the 70s and 80s uh, horror paperback boom. And one of the books in there, uh, I'm trying to do a script of. Um, uh, the, the author was foolish enough to option me the rights. <laughs> and so it's basically HP uh, Lovecraft monsters versus the mafia in <laughs> early 90s New York. It's the most ridiculous thing. It's a lot of fun. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. yeah. What's next for Subway Cinema? When's your next uh, event? Go for it, Paul. <laughs> no, no, you're the guest. Uh, oh, it's Old School Kung Fu Fest, which is May 3rd and 4th. We're doing it at the Anthology Film Archives. And we kind of had so much fun doing the Hong kong thon where we don't announce the titles before they hit the screen. Right. And people seem to like it. It makes it more fun. So we're splitting this up into chunks and basically doing... Uh, a movie and a party on Friday night, the third, and then on the fourth, we're doing six back-to-back old-school martial arts movies. We're doing three of them that are huge, huge celebrities movies before they were famous. So mm-hmm. it's international superstars like you've never seen them before. And then we're doing three movies that are like mashups. Like you'll always find mm-hmm. these Hong Kong old-school kung fu movies. Like it's a kung fu western, it's a kung <laughs> fu musical, it's a kung fu sci-fi movie so we found three amazing genre mashups like kung fu movies plus and so we're doing those (laughs) on the back end um and the fun thing about this stuff is so many of these movies they look like garbage when you see them at home they're pan and scanned they're cropped they're i mean they're they just look like dog shit and usually the prints we get you know these a lot of these movies were shot in scope um, mm. We try when we can to get them with subtitles, so that it's not always possible. But the prints look good, and so it's a really seeing these movies with an audience on the big screen. Like you're like, oh, this is actually made with a fair degree of, of skill, and you know, um, this is not a piece of crap for Saturday morning. Um, sometimes they are. Hard to believe that the print of a kung fu musical wouldn't it be you know so dog eared because everybody's watching that. Right. I know. <laughs> And does does this does that apply to also the police story movies? Because when I first seen them, I mean I've seen them on home VHS, which was obviously uh, I don't even think it was Panascan. I think it was just cropped. Um, so the 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 new prints that that we're going to be showing on on on, on the sixteenth um, are they kind of nice and pristine? Similar. I mean, were they new transfers and all that kind of stuff? Can you talk oh, about yeah, them? they're restored and the sound's been uh, remixed and everything. And they are incredible. I actually watched the Police Story One restoration in a movie theater with an audience here, and I'm curious if this phenomenon is going to repeat up in Schenectady. But at the beginning of the movie, you know, there's a lot of 80s stuff, and Jackie's got the big poofy hair, and everyone's in their 80s. <laughs> Sweaters. Here, so people are laughing, Sweaters. you know. Yeah. The subtitles are good, but they're not perfect. There's still some, like, weird Hong Kong-isms in the English subtitles. And people are laughing, and, you know, people pee their pants. Ha, ha, ha. And as the movie progresses, people start appreciating it more and more. But... When it gets to the final action scene, I had forgotten how relentless that is. Mm-hmm. And when you're watching it on a screen that's bigger than you, where the sound is like crystal clear, so you hear every impact, every blow. Like there was a moment in that final action scene where the audience was just beat down. Like you felt like you were getting punched in the face. Mm-hmm. Like it's just, you just sit there open mouth because it feels so brutal and i've never felt police story feeling brutal before but i mean in the best sense of the word brutal so it was like i was like brutal love making you know it's like it's good good brutal um oh, good. so i'd be curious if that repeats you know that the audience goes from ha ha campy 80s movie to oh that's that's pretty good huh? to holy shit 
hurts my soul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had natural born killers on the big screen, on our giant screen last week. And for uh, a person who's only seen it on disc before, uh, even good versions, I was now all of a sudden embarrassed to be a fan of the film. It was so, <laughs> it was shocking again, completely that different. That movie is one of my favorites. Yeah. And I saw that with my wife at one of those screenings when it came out, when people are like, you know, uh, do you want to see a free movie? And you go in, oh, it's wow. like one of those like, <laughs> and so we went in and it's That's this nice. packed theater and people were there with their kids. Oh, and when wow. it gets to the part wow. of the movie where it breaks and goes to one year later, you know, it's after that giant drug zone sequence yeah. and then it goes black. Some guy in this voice of like existential despair goes, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it is that amazing. movie. My wife, it's my wife's favorite rom com, so. You, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my wife's too. Yeah. Loves the movie with a passion. She adores it. Great. Well, this yeah. is amazing. Are Thank we gonna, you so much. Are we going to have Grady come up? Yeah, we, we got to get him come up again. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just, we just got to figure out a, a, figure an angle. Out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need an excuse, Grady. Come up soon. <laughs> awesome. Anytime I'm invited. Okay, well, come, awesome. oh, you're a, anytime, dude. Uh, I'll send you our schedule. If there's anything uh, on there you think that makes sense to to uh, um, attach yourself to, uh, consider yourself attached. Awesome. Well, Schenectady is all civilized now, too. So, like, yeah. I'll be there. I'm not scared <laughs> anymore. Yeah. <laughs>